Thank you all very much for your attendance. My name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute. And this is our last event before the break in August. So just if I could take the opportunity to thank all of our members and supporters for their uh, interest and their attendance uh, during, the, uh, during the last period. We've had a very busy few months some very interesting and uh, stimulating talks here in the building. And of course, we have um, our events online as well. So we've had uh, great support and interest. So thank you so much for that. Um, welcome all this afternoon to what I know is going to be a most um, interesting and um, stimulating talk by our guest of honour, Alexander Vinman, who's here. And Mary Cross, my colleague, is going to chair the event. Uh, and I'll hand over to her just in a moment. But just again, a warm welcome to all. And I don't like necessarily singling people out, but it's great to have the Commissioner of Angarda Shiakana, Drew Harris, with us and um, others uh, that I see. But if I start naming, um, I will leave somebody out. So I'll just mention the Commissioner and recognise his presence. And thank you very much for uh, your attendance. It's my pleasure to hand over now to Mary Cross to chair this event. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. And uh, indeed, it's my pleasure to reiterate um, a warm welcome to you today for uh, this in, in, uh, exceptionally important topic, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war, its cause, conduct and geopolitical context. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, for this discussion, Dr. Alexander Vindman, who's the former director for European affairs in the US National Security Council. And against the background of the continuing war in Ukraine, the continuing tragedy of Russian um, tar continuing to target civilians, uh, and the discussion very active in the West uh, as to how best to support Ukraine in the continuing and ongoing war, uh, this discussion indeed is as important as it is timely. And for your time, uh, Dr. Vindman, uh, and for being here, we would like to thank you. Um, just a couple uh, of rules of the house. Um, Dr. Vinman will speak to us for about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll go to question and answer with our audience. Uh, we would appreciate if you could um, indicate your name and affiliation if you're asking a question. Uh, to those in the room, uh, if you put up your hands and we will ensure that you have a microphone. And to those uh, many who are joining us on Zoom today, uh, please feel free to post questions as they occur to you, uh, and you can use the Q&A function on, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, today's presentation uh, and the Q&A are both on the record, and you can join the discussion on X uh, using the handle uh, at IIEA. I'd just like to formally introduce uh, Dr. Vindman. Uh, who has joined us from a holiday in the west of Ireland, which, uh, uh, where he experienced Irish weather. So um, I think he might be suffering somewhat the effects of that, but uh, thank you. Uh, so Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Alexander Vinman is a retired US Army Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, he was the Director for European Affairs at the Na White House's National Security Council from 2018 to 2020. Uh, before that, he served uh, as the political military affairs officer for Russia, for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and as an attaché also at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and Kiev. While on the Joint Staff, he co-authored the National Military Strategy Russia Annex. He earned an M.A. from Harvard University, uh, where he serves as a Hauser leader and a PhD from the John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies, where he is currently a senior fellow. And Dr. Vindman leads the National Security Think Tank, the Institute for Informed American Leadership. He is also an executive board member for the Renewed Democracy Initiative, a senior fellow at the Kettering Foundation, and a senior advisor uh, to vote vets. You probably wonder how he fits, fits in all those activities. Uh, his best-selling memoir is titled here, Right Matters, and that was published in 2021. And I should have mentioned at the beginning that uh, Dr. Vindman was born in Ukraine and moved to the United States when he was uh, three years old. So we're very interested to hear your informed and uh, uh, background knowledge on the, this current conflict, Dr. Vindman. So the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Alex, uh, Minister. Uh, pleasure having you here. Um, so I think 
we'll have a robust conversation. It could be about U.S. politics. I know that's a uh, I, it's a hobby here to watch U.S. politics and the implications of uh, um, our elections on um, Russia Ukraine war, frankly, on on uh, geopolitics at large. Uh, but I just finished up my doctoral. When I finished up my doctoral dissertation, it was on the topic of U.S. policy towards uh, Russia and Ukraine since 1991. Um, and while I wrote it from the standpoint of a U.S. Um, former U.S. policymaker, I think a lot of the lessons learned can be extrapolated to the way that you, you, uh, Europe as a whole kind of conducted its foreign policy with regards to Ukraine. And um, I think that we, when we started our post-Soviet relations, we had a legacy behind us. We had a legacy of Cold War. We had a legacy of uh, recognition of Soviet power. And we had... Mm -hmm. Um, we had a buy-in to Russia's sense of exceptionalism. So those narratives were were quite critical. They carried through to um, carried through for the first thirty five years. They carried through to critical moments around our decisions um, around Ukraine's independence, around uh, Ukraine's denuclearization, around the Orange Revolution, around the start of the war in two thousand and fourteen, carried through to twenty twenty two, carried through to today. And and some so those those uh, artifacts of our understanding have to do with Russia's kind of unique place in the world, largest uh, country by size, vast uh, nuclear arsenal, uh, once considered a competent conventional military, uh, um, seemingly endless resources. <clears throat> those are part of the narrative that compelled us to. Didn't have to, but certainly uh, resulted in us buying into a Russian sense of exceptionalism, uh, wanting us to wanting the West as a as a <clears throat> as a rule to cater towards uh, preserving, enhancing relationships with Moscow at the expense of potential opportunities with uh, other uh, countries in the region, including significant countries like Ukraine, uh, which which is uh, was a country of fifty million people, uh, significant um, industrial potential, but. We didn't necessarily fully understand that Ukraine was a sovereign, separate, sovereign, independent state. Uh, I think there's a Russian narrative here also at play. For the Russians, Russian identity centered around Great Russia, Moscow, the Russian Federation territory as as it's recognized today, Belarus, uh, the white Russians, and then the little Russians, Ukrainians, um, which is what they referred to the Ukrainians as. And that really Ukraine wasn't a, a sovereign independent state. It was just a, a political fluke that uh, Ukraine ended up independently. And uh, you could see that play out in the decisions that the U.S. made relatively early on, catering to maintaining Russian uh, coherence over uh, what was at one point a Russian empire or the, uh, the former Soviet space. When when President Bush Sr. showed up to uh, Ukraine in um, in the summer of 1991, just really months before the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, collapsed in, in December. Uh, he talked about uh, rampant um, nationalism, run amok, and counseled against it uh, on on the basic notion that uh, it would was in U.S. interests to preserve a Russian control, Kremlin control over the the periphery. That that's a, a critical narrative that still carries forward, less so now. But certainly through the earlier part of the, of these 35 years of post-Soviet relationships, not fully understanding that Ukraine has actually been involved in a struggle, which might resonate with the population here, for its own independence for hundreds of years. <clears throat> um, Ukraine was the, the cradle of Slavic civilization in a lot of ways. Kiev and Rus, which predated the, the for foundation of Russia by hundreds of years, was the regional power in uh, there. It ended up falling apart in the early uh, 13th century because the Mongol hordes sacked and destroyed. Well, it was infighting amongst the, the prince, uh, princes in the region, but the city ended up getting sacked uh, in the uh, beginning part of the 12th, uh, 13th century, which allowed space for Moscow to emerge in its own right. And then Ukraine uh, started, existed in, in the context of parts of other empires, the Lithuanian, Polish-Lithuanian Empire, part of it occupied by the uh, Ottoman Empire. This relationship um, became most defined in the in the 17th century, 
where Ukraine started to develop its own individual, was looking to define itself as, a, as an independent state, casting around for allies, looking to, to counter um, the dominance of the Polish-Lithuanian Empire, and looked towards the, the friendly-looking um, Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox uh, Moscow, and thought that they were signing up for a marriage of convenience, instead, um, um, from the Russian perspective, subscribing to Russian power and dom domination. So this is the history, certainly we could say the last 350 years at least is a part modern history, the context of, of Ukraine fighting for its independence, uh, aggressively fighting for its independence and uh, achieving some level of independence at the tail end of World War I, where Ukraine ended up becoming uh, a, an independent state for a brief flash, several years. Uh, and then when the communists came in, recognizing that they would have to contend with a um, a um, um, a uh, thorn of uh, Ukrainian nationalism accepted a whole host of sovereign, or uh, correction, not sovereign, but uh, nationalist states. That's where you have the formation of, of these 15 republics. It was Ukraine and Georgia specifically that insisted on national sovereignty that compelled the creation of the Soviet Union in not as a communist uh, Soviet empire, post-Soviet empire, but as 15 republics. And that was the seed of, um, of Ukrainian independence in 1991. Those, that regional uh, national identity that the Ukrainians were, even under Soviet pressure, were able to nurture. But that, that's not a context that, that, it, that really is, it was accepted or understood in, in the West. What con the context that was understood was, was Russian exceptionalism. So um, you have this, this really um, interesting dynamic in which the Russian narrative is adopted and um, is, the mess, is, the, is the narrative that seems to carry forward where, rather than the Ukrainian narrative, which at, at moments actually achieved its own sovereignty and independence, whether it's the early part of the 20th century or the late part of the 20th century. The Russians will contend that Ukraine is uh, is not a, a valid state. It's a uh, you know in Putin's conception, it was a mistake uh, for uh, Lenin to have adopted a um, republic format to the Soviet Union. But that's a result of, of of struggle on the Ukrainians to define themselves as sovereign, independent entity. Uh, I mentioned this because these are these are some of the narratives that that seem to carry even forward to today. Um, another narrative that, that's critical is that uh, it was the West that provoked this war. It was the uh, NATO enlargement that provoked this war. We negate the fact that it was the, the sovereign independent states in Eastern Europe that demanded um, security because they had the experience of, of uh, being subject to the Soviet um, imperialism, Soviet co colonization in the post-World War II era. They do, these are countries with independent agency and they flex their muscles, including Poland going so far as to make noises about pursuing its own nuclear deterrent, which was one of the reasons that, that uh, um, the, the West was swayed to accept the NATO enlargement to include Poland in the first round. And uh, it was something that the Ukrainians felt acutely too. They were subject to uh, Russian and then Soviet power for for extended periods of time, and that's why in 2008 the U.S. Um, made some half steps in terms of uh, considering uh, NATO expansion to include uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, it was not, uh, but this was a, uh, should be understood as as half steps at best, where there was a long term view of Ukraine joining NATO, but there was no concrete plan. So there was no real uh, pretext for Russia to conduct either the 2014 invasion or 2022 invasion. It was entirely about Russian identity and drawing Ukraine back into the fold. So I wanted to spend a, a brief moment talking about those, those important narratives because so even here in, in Dublin for the past couple of days, I, I've heard this narrative about, well, is Ukraine really a, its own independent state? Is Ukraine... Um, is, isn't NATO enlargement the reason for this war? Those are Russian propagated narratives that have received uh, some purchase in, in the Western world. 
and they require, uh, uh, I think they require some time to address those. Now, in terms of the war, uh, where are we are now? Where are we now? We've gone through several campaign cycles uh, um, in this war. The first one uh, driven by Russian hubris and Russian chauvinism over Russian power versus Ukrainian power was this idea of a flash shock and awe war that would quickly um, subdue Ukraine. The Ukrainians operating under their own uh, strength with little help from the West, that should be absolutely clear. The US provided uh, a small number of anti-tank systems, a limited number of air defense, uh, uh, tactical air defense systems, was able to resist a Russian um, a seizure of the entirety of the country and expel Russia from around Kiev and expel Russia from around Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. Uh, in, in this moment, uh, the US and NATO decided to um, accelerate support in the summer of, of 2022, but in half measures and fits and starts, buying into the sense of exceptionalism, again, buying into the fact that we needed to somehow look past a short war towards a long-term relationship with Russia uh, as the exceptional power in the region, and arrested the ability to provide Ukraine with sufficient support. It was that sense of exceptionalism. It was the buy-in to Russian um, might and the, the fears over a Russian nuclear saber rattling, the fears of escalation that arrested support in a critical juncture in which Russia was off balance. Russia didn't have a theory of victory. Its, its theory of victory, which is quick, quick snatch and grab, uh, uh, faltered. And then they settled in on attritional warfare. And that, that's been going on for, uh, for now about two years, uh, at least a year and a half. Russia is still not achieving, doesn't really have a concrete theory of victory. Russia is not achieving significant military gains on the battlefield. There is one or two directions where they're making some significant tactical gains, but those are not going to fundamentally change the outcomes of this war or drive towards a, towards a conclusion. So we, two and a half years on, we're at a, at a dilemma. Russia's theory of victory has faltered, but what is the Western theory of victory? What is US, what is NATO's theory of victory? What that and here I have a, a prescription. Again, since I get I guess since I I write strategies, I have an idea of, of a vision that we could cast that brings us much closer to nego the negotiation phase than the muddling through that we we're experiencing uh currently. And this is the idea of a hold, build, strike um approach. Holding Russian uh, Russia's uh, withholding or withstanding Russia's onslaught right now over the course of the rest of this year, which the Ukrainians are doing okay uh, at right now, uh, with F-16s coming in within the next uh, within within weeks that'll further enable the Ukrainian defense. Uh, they need to uh, uh, get some sure-footedness because they're a little bit off balance in one particular direction. They, I have confidence that they'll be able to to, to do that. They've been dynamic and innovative thus far, although they're spread thin and the troops are worn out. But that only gets us to kind of a, a steady state. What is, the, or what is the next step? The next step is a doubling down on mobilization. Uh, that's manpower. Ukraine probably needs to draw about 300,000 troops in to fill the, the, the losses within the ranks, create new units, build a strike force, and then mobilize the economy. Uh, there are a lot of things they could be doing right now in terms of really doubling down on success in terms of drone warfare, uh, that's strategic, operational, and tactical drone manufacturing. And then what could the West do? The West could could invest in these uh, in, in Ukraine's drone warfare. It could also uh, pass additional masses of, of equipment forward to Ukraine under a theory that uh, successful battlefield operations by the latter half of next year could drive towards negotiation we could make some investments in that kind of strategy, and we could pass uh, pre-positioned stocks, brigade sets of pre-positioned stocks. I don't want to get too technical, but we're talking about th something that equips about 5,000 troops with, with uh, robust pieces of hardware. And then we need to do undertake some training of the Ukrainian armed forces to, to better conduct combined arms operations, something that we have not done. We've done basics, basic training. We've not done the complex uh, uh, planning, synchronization, coordination work that you would get from tr highly trained staffs that can bring in all the resources required for successful operations to breach for, uh, fixed fortifications, armor, infantry, um, artillery, 
air defense, electronic warfare, engineers, all synchronized like a fine-tuned orchestra at one point in time to achieve a, a breakthrough. And then plan for successes. You have to have all the logistics in place. And then uh, we need to help the Ukrainians fix all the masses of equipment uh, that we provided, but we haven't provided them the spare parts to sustain it. So all this amounts to an ability to hold hold what the Ukrainians have right now, build over the course of the next year, and strike out in the second half of next year to set conditions for su successful negotiations. That plus the tailwinds of a, uh, of a U.S. Uh, Democratic administration could set the conditions for a, um, a negotiation phase.